So this final session is called Interpreting and Using Ocean Model Data. And I wanted to start off, well, um, hopefully it's going to let me change slides. Yeah, I'll just give you an outline. Um, I wanted to talk about a regional capacity building and what is it, and the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme, um, reviewing the activities we've done over the last few years since um, um, our first visit to St. Vincent in September 2017, as it happens. I think it was 2017, yes. And um, that was a very, a very stormy month and uh, quite some devastation going on in the Caribbean at that time. And then I will show some, you know, just talk about the applications of model outputs and what we might use them for would be including understanding processes affecting ocean circulation and processes affecting coastal risks. And then I will mention limitations of models and where next. So this is our vision of regional capacity building, but I want you to give me some feedback on does this um, chime with what is your vision? Are we giving you anything that's useful and wh where should we be? What, what should we be trying to do that's different? So um, referring back to the very beginning of this workshop, we're now in the ocean, UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And we recognize the need for developed countries like the UK to help in building capacity for developing nations to understand and manage their marine space and resources. And this workshop is part of this effort. So we'd like to share knowledge and also understand local needs. It shouldn't be just a one-way street. We want the two-way interaction. It's really important to us. The need for monitoring of key variables in the ocean is important to understanding the health of our ocean, the effects of climate change and the impacts of human exploitation of the oceans. And the global ocean observing system, as was mentioned again the earlier last week, can give expert guidance on these parameters and how to measure them. Um, however, it's recognized that observational data will always be sparse and limited, which is where ocean models come in. Once validated, they can help extrapolate and interpolate between existing data and make projections of the future. Application of our regional uh, Caribbean regional hydrodynamic wave models on approximately 12 kilometers, well, actually it's more like 10 kilometer grid in the Caribbean, may be a benefit to many SIDs, small island developing states. The 2D NEMO surge model can provide water level, in other words, a model tides and surges. The 3D hydrodynamic model can also provide water level, but uh, 3D current profiles, temperature and salinity. And the wave model can provide integrated variables like wave height, period and direction, as Lucy has just explained, as well as full frequency directional spectra for input, which is very useful for driving coastal wave models and beach models. Making data available more widely is a key goal, ensuring long-term benefits of new tools and data sets. Training, sharing data inventories, and the use of accessible data portals can make it possible to measure once, but use many times. Future collaboration on research projects will be very important. Ensuring that the projects address the real needs of stakeholders in the region, but providing access also to international funding. So I would very much like if you'd put something in the chat where you agree or don't agree about some of those points. You know, we do not want to come in and say, this is what you need. We want to know and, and, um, and help understand um, where we can bring information and where there are gaps still in the information. So this is the um, overview of the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme, which has funded our work over the last four years. And it's enabling self and sustainable, safe and sustainable marine economies across 17 Commonwealth small island developing states. Um, the blue economy, as it's known. This program supports um, Commonwealth marine economies, SIDS, by supporting the islands to build capacity to manage their marine resources and developing, develop their national marine maritime economies. So we recognize that um, an island has has limited resources, it has a, a long coastline for its area, but it also often has a huge economic zone, which uh, it provides a lot of resource, but is it is it possible to exploit it fully um, for the benefit of the, um, the country that owns that area? Uh, I've got timer on here. Okay, never mind. Um, so 
The programme de delivery partners were the UK Hydrographic Office, the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science, and the National Oceanography Centre, which is ourselves, and Atkins. So I'm just going to give an overview of what we've done up to now. And this was, um, this, we started at the beginning looking at the, the issues around climate change impact and adaptation and where we could bring tools from monitoring and modeling um, to help assist in getting data and understanding. So we had this uh, red sector is the capacity building. We've um, developed software for automatic data processing and done regional training workshops. Um, the regional to local scale modeling, which you've heard about in the past with coastal scale SWAN and the X Beach modeling for St. Vincent. Um, coastal observing system, we've, we've done some um, beach, um, We've done some observations with AWACS and, and, and St. Vincent still has an AWAC, which they can use for other studies. But also we've um, been able to access beach profile monitoring um, that's been carried out within the islands. And uh, finally, the St. Vincent test case in particular, data-driven modeling and looking how you could have a, an early warning system and data impl input template. So, um, yeah, these are the activities that we carried out over the... Uh, the phases of this Commonwealth Mean Economies program. Phase two was in September uh, 2017 to March 2018, that six month period. And with a scoping visit, a case study of, of using the coastal wave model for the airport and uh, stakeholder consultation and training workshop. In phase three and four, we uh, did a much, much more work. That was really our intensive period where we did some um, Caribbean-wide modeling, regional to local, focus on, on St. Vincent. We developed software for tide gauge analysis. We set up a pilot data portal and we did some capaci a capacity building technical workshop where we did much more hands-on exercises in, in accessing and using data from satellites and models. And then we uh, deployed uh, the AWAC Gage, which has been mentioned, and produce some guidance notes in the final workshop in uh, 2020, March 2020. We were actually out there just before uh, coronavirus hit us all and um, and closed down the program, or at least all the travel. So, and finally, this this last phase has been a six month intensive period during which we've done these uh, two capacity building workshops, looking at the stakeholder engagement in November and trying to develop um, some useful tools and outputs for this workshop today, um, disseminating all the work that we've done under the phases three and four, plus extracting some extra results from the regional wave and hydrodynamic models for some output locations in def different countries, um, developing particle tracking for sargassum. This particle tracking could be used also for plastic waste and other pollutants. And we have a PhD student project working on this, so there will be definitely more information to come in the future. And finally, for us as well, we prepare papers for peer reviewed publication. Um, this is um, a picture of the workshop that happened. Um, well, it's one of the workshops. I think this is the uh, January, no, this is the March 2018 workshop, the original workshop, which Lucy attended and uh, Jenny, who you've also seen this week, and Amani is there. And um, this was looking at the, the main issues of the hotspots around St. Vincent and uh, getting some interaction between people and giving some basic overviews on coastal um, oceanography and satellite oceanography. And then um, at the original uh, scoping visit, it probably should have appeared first, but anyway, I consulted with various key agencies, trying to include as many as possible that had an interest in, um, in coastal wave climate and coastal impacts from climate change. Um, and we, we carried out some model, um, some measurements, sorry, um, help, with help from Coastal Dynamics in Trinidad, who deployed a wave, uh, wave and current profiler. And of course, this has, been, this has been demonstrated by Lucy, how we can help to validate the model. And this is the deployment. And this is the page where this is actually the permanent service for mean sea level um, Commonwealth Marine Economies data portal. It's a very, very um, first look at how you could provide information to share. It's still there, it can be used. And some of the things that you can do, for, you can click on um, automatic quality control process and look at the, um, the software that was developed and uh, look at some analysis of the tie gauges in the region. 
and uh, yes, we also have um, a project web page on our on our main um, NOC web page, and this is uh, for the our particular um, project. So, if you if you look at this um, this page, you will then see a link for projects, and this one is ocean modeling and monitoring for Caribbean small island developing states. And this is all the work that we've done. This is our workshop report from November, and you can download other reports on all the activities and all the, the outputs that we made. Um, it's sort of internal reports that help to just uh, give some guidance if you want to redeploy the AWAC, for instance. And we've also recorded interviews with stakeholders in St. Vincent, and it, it was edited and made into a nice video, which can be viewed there. So obviously we started with the premise that this is one of the biggest issues, coastal erosion and flooding, and combined with climate change for small island developing states. It's the ocean oceanographic issues, which we can address. As not saying that's not the only problem, obviously, but the causes um, and, and uh, factors affecting um, uh, coastal erosion and sea level rise is one of the very most important and how setback is going to have to be used in order to uh, limit development very close to the shore. So sea level and erosion was addressed in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in previous reports like the Carib Safe Climate Change Risk Atlas. And um, this has been, a, you know, previously published, and you can see here some estimates of um, how much there would be a loss of, of tourism resorts or sea turtle nesting sites and transport infrastructure, um, the, the airport and road networks, um, with given levels of sea level rise. A one meter sea level rise by the end of the century is fairly conservative these days. It's uh, possibly as much as two meters to be expected. So, and, and if that happened, you might lose as much as 24% of the major tourism resorts. You know, this is, this is not a joke. We really need to emphasize how important this is. And the erosion, which has been estimated it by a rather simple rule of thumb, is, um, is, is estimated to be quite significant. And it's really being seen I know this is being seen in different areas. This is showing um, a beach in Mustique before and after Hurricane Lenny. Hurricane Lenny was a very interesting storm that happened in November 1999. It was category four, but it was a backhanded storm because it actually formed in the Western Caribbean and traveled eastwards, which is very unusual. Uh, of course, it then was able to attack many, many islands from behind, if you like, from the leeward side, which is, um, uh, they're, they're, they're less um, normally impacted coast, uh, coastline. Um, so what are the data needs? These absolutes, we really need these. Sea level rise and the rate of change of sea level rise. We need atmospheric model outputs, wind speed and direction, sea level atmospheric pressure, um, which generates this inverse barometer effect. One centimeter of sea level is raised for every one millibar of pressure drop. So a 930, millibar, a 930 millibar storm with a central pressure of 930 millibars will be um, generating a, a surge of as much as 80 centimeters. Um, then tide and storm surge water levels. We need to record them, but we need to uh, model them as well and waves at the coast, as Lucy has been discussing. And of course, currents, transport, pollutants, nutrients, et cetera. So we need to look at currents as well, because they are the things that are bringing and washing the shores, bringing nutrients, bringing pollution, uh, carrying away plastics, bringing sargassum. So this is um, a summary of the uh, what we know about the sea level trends in the Caribbean basin. It's taken from satellite on the left. We've got the, um, the pattern over the, the map, if you like, of the, uh, the spatial distribution over the Caribbean from 1993 to 2018. And you can see that although there's a background level global mean trend of three millimeters per year, and that's been subtracted. And this is the differences, plus or minus, um, um, maybe as much as half a, a millimeter per year on top. Um, which shows that there is actually a depression in the center and a, a raising of sea level at the north and south extremes. Here on the right, we've got this, um, you know, the projection of um, mean sea level um, into the 21st century. And we're only here in 2020, and we're still not seeing the huge amount of projected increase that will come about. But there's no doubt in my mind that this is coming. This is going to be happening 
because there's no way we can now stop the emissions. Even if we stop the emissions, we're not going to stop the sea level rise. And this is some of the, um, the ex you know, the, the error bars, if you like, or the extreme limits. So up to two meters is not impossible. That's the 95th percentile um, projected sea level change in the RCP 8.5 scenario, not forgetting RCP 8.5 is business as usual and we haven't changed our business. So we are going to get that level if we're not careful. Right, so, um, you know, results for um, of wave and surge models for Hurricane Thomas are definitely of interest or uh, any, any event, but this is Hurricane Thomas, which was a close um, hit on uh, and St. Lucia and uh, St. Vincent in October 2010. And on the left, we have the wave heights and on the right, we have uh, the non-tidal residuals we talked about the, the other day. Now, ocean processes in models. Um, there are a lot of things going on in the ocean and uh, many of which we have not touched on because a lot of the time we've been uh, focusing on um, sea level and waves at the coast. But ocean models are, ca are calculating all of these processes. So we've got various currents transporting things around. We've got internal tides and waves. Um, we have this mid-ocean ridge, just, um, it, it is doing interesting tidal mixing. Um, we've got surface waves on the top and they do interesting things right across the ocean, not just at the coast. And so this is the kind of, complexity that we're trying to capture in an ocean model. Um, it can help us to know what the currents are going to be, what's the background currents, but also what the fluctuating currents are going to be, what the interannual variability of the temperature and the salinity can be. So this is our pattern of currents for the Caribbean. And we can see that we have the North Brazil current and the Guyana current, whichever you call it, uh, coming in from the uh, Southeast and following the coast. And then it becomes part of the Caribbean current. That in turn becomes part of the Gulf of Mexico loop current. And then it exits going to the Florida current and eventually back into the Gulf Stream. So this is part of a whole ocean basin circulation. Um, but it, it obviously is um, quite variable in space and time. Um, coastal modeling, as Lucy has shown, you know, we, we need these large scale models. We need the global to the regional and then down to the local scale in order to get really useful um, coastal um, models for particular engineering applications, as Cameron was talking about. And that's what we have used in, in the past. But today we're talking about mainly the Caribbean wide um, area. And we're looking here at the Caribbean Sea and the coastal, um, sorry, the ocean hazards, if we like, that we've shown several times this week that was calculated from our work initially at St. Vincent, but it's this is Caribbean wide. Um, so we have uh, exposure from various hazards, um, water levels, waves, wind, and present day rates of sea level rise. And what we haven't included here is the local geomorphology and beach slope, et cetera, which would um, impact on an Ireland scale. So here we have a yellow to orange, moderate um, impact, if you like, or vulnerability. Whereas here, Turks and Caicos in the Bahamas is uh, at the highest um, risk. And then some of the green coasts in the more sheltered leeward coasts of um, South America or the larger islands, we're certainly seeing uh, lower risk, not zero risk, obviously, but um, yeah. So if we then come to the local scale, which is where people absolutely need to know what's going on, um, this is again back to St. Vincent and looking at calculating coastal vulnerability at the local scale, including this the geomorphology, the shoreline erosion and accretion rate, and the coastal slope and rates of sea level change, mean wave height and tidal range were taken from our um, previous work. But obviously around St. Vincent, we've got a rocky coast in the north. We've got black sand on the west and east coast and some white sand on the south coast. And the beach slope comes out at about six to eight percent for all those um, locations. And I have to thank uh, Abina White from the National Parks Department um, who, who provided the data. And I will be speaking to her later about a paper that we've got her name on as well to try and refer to all this data. So the rate of retreat has been estimated from a um, aerial photographs is about 2.2 meters per year, in, in particularly in the East Coast. So we can now estimate those vulnerabilities, which scale are we in for the whole of St. Vincent. And just bringing in a, another, another item, which um, is not 
is not in our CME work, but this is what we've been doing in another project. And we've been looking at the threats to mangrove ecosystems and challenges for restoration. Um, this is, applies to the, the Caribbean though, as well as it does for the Pearl River Delta in China, which is where we were, were focusing before. So we have, um, you know, the threats are coming from atmospheric forcing, from um, changing climate, from sea level rise and cyclones in uh, tropical cyclones in, in the um, in the China, East, South China Sea are called typhoons. But, and then we have river effects. How are rivers going to change? How does the salt and fresh water affect the mangrove system? Uh, mangroves are salt tolerant, but they're not, they, they prefer fresh water. So, you know, if it gets more saline, we're putting another stress on mangroves. And we also have the effect of sea level rise and storm surges, which also put stress on those mangrove systems. And um, so we've looked at, uh, we have a project where we're still completing the work to look at how um, various um, models can help determine where mangroves can thrive or where they're under stress. And uh, mangroves in the Caribbean are distributed according to this, this map. Um, in the red, you see the coastal, where there are coastal mangroves. In the green, we've actually got uh, locations where some, um, R set measurements were taken, rod surface elevation table, which allows for high precision measurements of the sediment elevation in mangroves, which is extremely key. There's uh, the different species, I um, won't go with, through that, but Caribbean mangroves have declined by about 24% over the last quarter century. And there's a similar estimates about 1.9% a year globally are being lost. And sea level rise is one of the most immediate and biggest threats to mangroves in the Caribbean. Because can the mangroves keep up with the rate of sea level rise? Can the sediment supply keep up with what's required to carry on keeping pace with sea level rise? This was taken from um, a report produced by Rich Wilson of impacts of climate change on mangrove ecosystems for Caribbean small island developing states, which was actually produced also under the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme. So, um, model insights, what do models tell us? Well, we feel that it's very important that we use correct attribution of processes, because if we can understand the risks, we'll be closer to managing them. And one example is that the importance of waves that we want to bring out in contributing to tidal surge and also to riptides. Both of those things are misnamed. They have nothing to do with tides and they have nothing really necessarily to do with the surge either. So waves can be a large component of the tidal surge in areas where there's not much shallow water to build up the wind, uh, wind effect of, of the surge. Riptides are actually waves. They are nothing to do with tides at all on beaches. Many of you'll know about the rip currents that can occur um, um, and it's because of the behavior of, of waves on a, a long coast. For steep volcanic islands, like many in the Lesser Antilles, waves contribute up to 100% of the increase in water level, which is attributed to the storm. Obviously, it varies from case to case. I'm not going to say it's the same everywhere. And then coastal infrastructure is at risk. Sea level will continue to rise, even if we stop CO2 emissions immediately. So, I'm just putting in a little plug here for ocean modelers. Numerical models, do it by numbers. Obviously, it's a pretty little girl, but we are, we are doing it with, uh, with computer models. Right, model limitations, and there are many. I don't want you to go away with the assumption that models are perfect. We're not trying to say that at all. There are many assumptions and approximations that are made before you even construct a, a new numerical model and before you do any calculations. And I won't go through the details of those, but um, we have models which are being developed, which can actually avoid those assumptions and give us more accurate outputs. But inevitably, they cost more to run because they're going to be more complicated and, um, and solving more detailed equations, et cetera. We need to know the convergence, consistency, and stability of our numerical methods means that we get a solution that is related to the real solution of the full equations. We can't solve the full equations. That's why we solve models. We use numerical models. But these are key uh, things that need to be done to check that the model is actually, um, you know, producing a, um, a result that's uh, related to the real world. 
these are all very techie modeler things. This is not sort of um, trying to say that you need to worry about that, but we do need to say that the models cannot be perfect. Another issue is always going to be horizontal resolution. So we cannot get as, as high resolution in a global model as we'd like. So therefore we are either having to do some nesting or some um, unstructured grid modeling, things that will allow us to get higher resolution at the coast. There's a big, big issue, and I'm not going to describe the methods of vertical discretization in models, but this is a big problem area. And it means that you can actually get errors in models if you use the wrong type of, of vertical um, discretization in your model. There's the issue around parameterization of subgrid scale mixing. So we've got a finite size grid box. It might be a kilometer by a kilometer. Inevitably, there are processes right down to molecular scales that we're not directly modeling. And so you have to approximate them in some way. There are going to be some errors due to that. There's really tricky things that um, we still don't really fully know how to do properly in models, like convection, deep water formation, divergence and upwelling where some of the um, assumptions that are made actually constrain the model and maybe we're not getting the right answer but you know um, we really need to know about this the things like the um, atlantic meridional overturning circulation that probably people have heard about it's it's really important that it keeps moving because it's uh, it's forced by the cooling of water at high latitudes and sinking it all happens in the atlantic and then that drives the uh, its component of driving the the um the motion of the uh, of the warmer water going north and the colder water at the bottom coming south, and um, that is um, really one of the motors that keeps our planet as warm as it is. And and for us in Europe in particular, we like the warm water that comes across, and also the warmer winds that come from the equator. There's bias in models, and sometimes this can be corrected by data assimilation for operational models and reanalysis, but sometimes it can't be, especially once we want to project into the future. How do we correct for bias? Um, and data assimilation is great, but it's actually fixing the a model that's half broken. So if it's not doing the right thing, data assimilation will bring it back on track. There's things like eddies, which are a bit are difficult to get deterministic um, re results for. So you've already seen some of the particle tracking in the Caribbean, that particles go in different directions because there are eddies in the currents and they ne don't necessarily just follow a straight line path. And then, you know, that can be addressed by model ensembles. That means running lots of models simultaneously. So we have some variability and uh, randomness in the model. And then we try and address some of the uncertainties by looking at model ensembles. Right, that's just one look. I'm just trying to say there are lots of issues for modelers still to solve. Uh, so finally, I believe, and I'm hoping that you now believe that there's a need for ocean model outputs because we cannot make measurements everywhere and we never will. For forecasting, we need accurate model forecasting, forcing, such as winds, pressures, and heat flux. And the accuracy of the, the outputs that we get can be limited by this. So we're not necessarily going to get the right answer just because the winds that we're blowing over our model are wrong. It might not be our model that's wrong, it might be the atmospheric model. But again, for model sh short for short-term forecasting, like weather forecasting, we can correct model errors as we go along using data assimilation. But if you want to do climate change projections, projections, we use the same models, but we can't keep assimilating data. We need the best models we've got, and we have to continue to improve them. And look out for IPCC AR6 coming out in the next year or two. Sharing data is important, collect data once used many times. We need free open access to data and data portals um, so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then I'll just leave you with the message of keep a healthy skepticism about model capabilities and results. There's no such thing as a perfect model. And somebody said, and it's attributed to um, um, a statistician called Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Treating a model as a black box is dangerous. Consult the experts. We are happy to help. Thank you very much. So any final questions or discussion, I'll be very glad to hear from you what you think and um, whether we're missing the point and please tell us what you need.